two kilometers high. And there are these tongues of ice hanging down the sheer cliff face. And you can imagine that would be quite an interesting place to be in. Uh, and up here my, to the right might be a nice place to ski on. I don't think anyone will do that in the near future, however. Well, these are some of the pictures that we looked at before landing on Mars. And when I say we looked at it, many, many scientists involved. And here is a picture of uh, a group of them looking in stunned amazement at uh, some of the first pictures. And I show it to you to indicate this is not uniquely an American enterprise. Uh, this gentleman is C.B. Farmer, and this gentleman is Michael Carr. Both of them are British citizens. I picked it out just to show the British audience that it is possible to be British and to be in planetary astronomy uh, at the same time, although there's not much evidence of that in the United Kingdom at the present moment. Now, the question of landing on Mars is a difficult one. We had never landed on Mars before. And there are things about Mars which might, we might consider dangerous. There were very peculiar radar reflection characteristics from Mars. A radar telescope on the Earth gave an indication of extremely soft ground on Mars. There were other places where we thought the ground was extremely rough. And the spacecraft coming down was very vulnerable to uh, a rough or soft ground or many other criteria. The spacecraft is uh, oh, a few meters wide and uh, one or two meters high. A rock of a meter size could make the thing land at a peculiar angle, roll over, and die. Uh, if the ground was very soft, the spacecraft might sink into the ground, say up to its eyebrows, and be unable to see anything on Mars. And that would be unpleasant. So we had to choose safe places. But since no one had ever landed on Mars, that wasn't so easy. What is more, the orbital photography of the sort I've just showed you had a resolution, an ability to see fine detail, which was at best only about 100 meters. Anything smaller than 100 meters, we couldn't see. But a rock a meter across could destroy us. So we had to somehow guess from what we see at 100 meter resolution to what might be on the ground at 1 meter resolution. And you can't do that unless you really understand the terrain. So the idea was to find places on Mars which were fabulously dull, in which there was nothing whatever of interest to be seen. That's the place to land. Now you can see that that lets out all of the exciting places we just looked at. You can't land in a river valley. You can't land on the slope of a volcano. You can't land in the polar ice. You can't land in any of those nice, interesting places. You have to land in the dullest, least interesting place you can find and hope that you could survive there. Now, an indication that we had to take this very seriously came from the fact that there had been at least three dramatic Soviet failures previously in trying to land on Mars. Um, and one of those failures is indicated in this postage stamp, uh, which uh, shows the Mars 3 spacecraft entering through a kind of uh, purple muck. You can see purple muck up here in the right. The artist who drew this postage stamp uh, quite correctly was indicating that the Mars 3 spacecraft had entered in the midst of a great sandstorm. The uh, Soviet spacecraft uh, had been pre-programmed so that where and when they landed on Mars was determined at the time of launch. And the fact that there was a great dust storm on Mars was, uh, uh, came in too late to change the uh, protocol. And what seems to have happened for Mars 3 is that it came into the Martian atmosphere had a big billowing parachute which slowed it down nicely, and it touched down at the Martian surface with a speed in this direction which was very gentle. Unfortunately, the big parachute very likely picked up the enormous winds that were driving the dust storm going this way, and so the spacecraft landed gently, vertically, in the horizontal direction. It was going extremely fast and perhaps hit some obstacle, fell over, lost radio communication with the flyby spacecraft, which was its link to the Earth, and failed within 20 seconds of landing. The later Soviet spacecraft failed mysteriously within one second of landing. So as a result of all this, we wanted to be extremely cautious. Now, a picture of where we hoped to land is shown here. This is 
a region called Chrysi, C-H-R-Y-S-E, which is Greek for the land of gold. And scientifically, it is a land of gold because you can see all the signs of past running water that are through this region, which is shown in this lovely mosaic. Now, we see a, an ellipse, which indicates how confident the navigation team was about where they could land. They said that there was a 99% chance that they could land within that outer ellipse. But when we looked closely at that terrain, it looked dangerous. Uh, at least it didn't look familiar. We weren't sure about it. And so we had to move. And here we have a picture of first where we originally started out, then where we hoped to get to next, and finally where we eventually settled on. And that took quite a while. And in that period of time, while we were trying to figure out uh, a safe place to land, July 4th, 1976 came and went. That was the bicentenary of the United States. It would have been nice to have landed on that date, but we thought it better to miss that date than to crash on that date. That seemed to us not to be a marvelous birthday present for the United States. So we, in fact, did not land until July 20th, 1976. Six. And we can take a look at a close-up of this fabulously dull region. You can see there has nothing whatever of interest on it. It has uh, a few impact craters. It has a kind of real soft muted terrain of the sort we know from on the moon. Well, there is this cross. If the cross was on Mars, this would be a place of some interest, of course. Um, but this was put on by the uh, artist to indicate where we hoped to land. In fact, Viking 1 successfully landed within about 30 kilometers of the designated landing place after an interplanetary voyage of over 200 million kilometers, which lasted more than a year. Precision targeting. The landing sequence went something like this. Here is the orbiter, which is separating from the lander wrapped up in its aero shell. The lander then slowly enters the Martian atmosphere, still in orbit, but spiraling in, slowed down by the Martian atmosphere. Then once in the Martian atmosphere, the lander, still in its aero shell, is uh, connected to the parachute, which is just unfurling or deploying. It opens up very large, 55 feet in diameter. That slows it down still further. And then finally, the retro rockets fire, which you can see here. And the spacecraft gently, we hoped, settles down on the Martian surface. Now, before I discuss what we found, I want to do several things. One is I want to show you a little bit about the Viking lander. And then I want to describe how the Viking cameras work, because that's essential if we're to understand the pictures that we will see. So here is a model, thank you, Bill, of the Viking lander. And we can see a number of things. First of all, there are foot pads, three of them. It's a three-legged beast and it lands on those three foot pads. Unfortunately, it cannot move the feet, so we cannot take a walk, and that's a point I will come back to towards the end. It talks to the Earth two ways. With this large radio telescope, it talks directly to the Earth when the Earth is in the sky. That is not always the case. More often, it talks to the orbiter when the orbiter is overhead with this smaller radio telescope right here. It has a computer which gives it a great deal of information about what to do and that computer can be instructed from the Earth so it can learn new things. As I mentioned before, it has retro rockets so that it can break as it lands, but they're turned off 
before it's over the landing place so it doesn't fry the ground that's to investigate. Um,